Imagine you were born as an heir to a legendary dynasty of immense and unfathomable wealth. What would you decide to do with your career? Certainly many of the old money scions we've studied on this channel decided to keep it simple, following the well-worn path of privilege and exclusive access to the world's most elite circles. And yet a few, like the enigmatic figure we'll cover today, did the exact opposite. Undoubtedly, Michael Rockefeller, raised in the soft embrace of a surname that is synonymous with vast wealth, and was not incidentally the son of a future vice president of the United States, is just one of those unique old money heirs who chose to march to the beat of his own drum, with potentially fatal consequences. Indeed, his journey from the comforting halls of Harvard University to the labyrinthine corners of a South Pacific jungle is a tale worthy of a Hollywood script, meeting at the intersection of privilege, power, and absolute danger. In today's episode, we'll share the full saga, from the silver spoon to the silver screen, of Michael Rockefeller, the Rockefeller heir who disappeared and never came back. In the chronicles of American old money dynasties, the ascent of the Rockefeller family is a saga steeped in industrial innovation, political sway, and philanthropic undertakings. Quite naturally, this storied surname traces back to John D. Rockefeller Sr., the architect of the Standard Oil Company, a pioneering trust in the U.S. business landscape, reigning supreme over the oil domain. Indeed, John D. Rockefeller's shrewd business tactics and visionary investments revolutionized the industry, transforming perceived waste into lucrative byproducts. And his relentless expansion approach, marked by the acquisition of smaller entities, laid the groundwork for contemporary American capitalism. By 1882, his empire, Standard Oil, commanded an astounding 90% of control over the nation's refineries. And beyond the realms of oil, Rockefeller's reach extended to the political sphere. His commercial methodologies spurred the inception of antitrust laws and bolstered union rights. Despite facing criticism over his wealth accumulation methods, the outcomes of his business strategies and philanthropic ventures have been profoundly beneficial. Furthermore, politically speaking, the Rockefellers gained prominence between the late 1800s and early 1900s. The Rockefeller Republicans, a faction within the Republican Party from the 1930s to the 1970s, championed moderate to liberal domestic policies, endorsing social welfare and the continuation of New Deal programs. And their advocacy for robust business and Wall Street ties underlined a vision of ostensibly harmonizing public interests with private entrepreneurship. Furthermore, philanthropy played a central role in the Rockefeller legacy. Upon retiring in 1896, John D. Rockefeller Sr. dedicated himself to charitable causes, donating immense wealth in his twilight years. Therefore, the sustained generational wealth of the Rockefeller family is attributed to a mix of diversified investments, philanthropic activities, strategic financial management, and emphasis on family governance and education. And today, the Rockefeller fortune is distributed among over 70 heirs. Now, one of these heirs, Michael Clark Rockefeller was born into the family on the 18th of May, 1938. The youngest of Nelson and Mary Todd Hunter Rockefeller's children, Michael was born into a world of affluence and privilege. You see, his father, Nelson Rockefeller, served as New York governor and even vice president of the United States, while his grandfather, John D. Rockefeller Jr., was a notable American financier and philanthropist, carrying on the family tradition of rapaciously amassing wealth and then breathlessly trying to give much of it away. Raised in Manhattan's family townhouse and the Westchester County estate, Michael's early life was marked by luxury. However, he exhibited a passion for the arts and a strong independent streak from a young age, and his inquisitive nature hinted at his later interests and pursuits that could be classed as unique for a Rockefeller. Michael's educational journey began at the Buckley School in New York City, followed by Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. At Exeter, he excelled as a student senator and varsity wrestler, and he later continued his academic pursuits at Harvard University, graduating cum laude with a degree in history and economics. But Harvard was not just an academic milestone for Michael. It was also a period of personal growth and exploration, particularly in art and anthropology. And the Rockefeller family's deep involvement in the arts Underscored by Michael's grandmother Abby Aldrich Rockefeller's role in founding the Museum of Modern Art and his father's establishment of the Museum of Primitive Art undoubtedly influenced Michael's affinity for artistic endeavors. 
Specifically, he developed a keen interest in primitive art, a term then used for non-Western art forms, particularly those of indigenous peoples. However, as we'll see in a minute, it was tragically this interest in primitive art that would lead young Michael into a mysteriously quiet part of the world where few Westerners, let alone heirs to one of the richest family fortunes in world history, had ever been. In stark contrast to his illustrious family, known for their pivotal role in bending Western institutions to their will, Michael Rockefeller harbored a profound attraction to foreign cultures, travel, and the arts. His fascination with anthropology and art was nurtured at Harvard University, where he graduated cum laude in history and economics. At Harvard, Michael was recognized as a, quote, quiet artistic spirit, veering away from the expected career path in banking or finance that his family anticipated. Instead, he was drawn to his family's Museum of Primitive Art and its showcase of indigenous art, particularly captivated by the Asmat people of Papua New Guinea. Post-Harvard, Michael joined a documentary crew from the Peabody Museum to film the Danny and Hubula indigenous people in Western Netherlands, New Guinea, and this venture deepened his interest in indigenous cultures, particularly the Asmat. To be specific, Michael's primary ambition was to introduce a significant collection of indigenous art to New York, a notable divergence from his family's traditional pursuits. Now, Michael's journey into the world of the Asmat began with a trip to New Guinea in March 1961, as part of a Harvard Peabody expedition. And his role as a sound recordist and photographer involved documenting the Grand Valley Dani, a group relatively isolated from external contact. Furthermore, this experience further fueled his passion for the Asmat tribe, known for their unique art and one of the last surviving Stone Age cultures. Just two months later, driven by a spirit of adventure and a quest to document a vanishing frontier, Michael quickly returned to New Guinea. This was because he was eager to delve even deeper into the Asmat culture, documenting their customs and beliefs. Thus, his second time in New Guinea, from May to July 1961, was spent immersing in the Asmat way of life, particularly fascinated by their six-meter bisje poles, central to their spiritual practices and headhunting rituals. But Michael's engagement with the Asmat culture extended beyond observation to active participation. He busied himself with collecting and trading for Asmat artifacts, aiming to document the context of their creation. And despite the known risks associated with the Asmat's practice of revenge killings, Michael's dedication to understanding and preserving their culture was unwavering. Ominously, in November 1961, Michael Rockefeller would pen a letter reflecting on his experiences with the Asmat culture in New Guinea. At the time, he likened it to a complex puzzle, one he was just beginning to understand. This introspection underscored his deep commitment to understanding and preserving the intricate Asmat society and its art forms. Then, Michael's last known expedition commenced on the 17th of November, 1961, aimed at acquiring Asmat carvings. Despite the perilous nature of New Guinea's terrain and the unpredictable Asmat customs, he never veered from his pursuit. This final foray was thus not just an exploration, but a testament to his growing obsession with the Asmat culture. Yet tragedy struck on the 19th of November 1961, when Michael vanished in the Asmat region of southwestern Netherlands, New Guinea. The day had begun with a journey between the villages of Agats and Aetis J in a 40-foot dugout canoe, which capsized in the Arafura Sea's turbulent waves. Stranded at sea, Michael and Dutch anthropologist René Wassing clung to the overturned vessel. After 24 hours, fearing they would drift further out to sea, Michael, equipped with a makeshift life preserver, decided to swim for the distant shore, while Wassing stayed with the boat. This was the last time Michael was seen, and the disappearance of Governor Nelson Rockefeller's son triggered an immediate and massive search operation. The Dutch government, wrestling with colonial challenges in the east, mobilized extensive resources, deploying ships, crews, and airplanes. The Rockefeller family, leveraging their wealth and political connections, launched an expansive search involving Nelson Rockefeller and his wife flying to New Guinea to join the efforts. Yet, sadly, despite these exhaustive efforts, no trace of Michael was found. In the wake of Michael's disappearance, a maelstrom of rumors and theories arose. 
Speculation ranged from him being killed by headhunters or wildlife to being kidnapped or living among the indigenous people. The Dutch government, keen to maintain control in New Guinea, suppressed stories suggesting Michael had been killed by natives. However, as reports persisted, the Rockefeller family, profoundly impacted by the loss, held to the belief that Michael drowned. But what exactly happened on that day, in November 1961? This enduring mystery continues to captivate the imagination, a poignant reminder of the enigmatic nature of Michael Rockefeller's last journey. Next, let's discuss some of the most popular theories about what happened to this lost Rockefeller and find out what lies beneath. Over the years, two prominent theories have emerged regarding the fate of Michael Rockefeller in 1961. These theories, the cannibalism theory and the escape and integration theory, offer contrasting narratives of his possible end. The cannibalism theory posits that Michael Rockefeller became a victim of the cannibalistic rituals of the Asmat tribe. This theory gained traction through rumors and media speculations, suggesting he had, quite literally, been killed and consumed by cannibals. Anthropologist Karl Hoffman, delving into this theory, claimed to have received confessions from villagers in Otsjanep about cannibalizing Rockefeller. Hoffman's research encompassed accounts from priests, a Dutch patrolman, and interviews with tribesmen allegedly connected to the killers. However, despite the weight of these accounts, Hoffman remained non-committal in his conclusion, leaving the theory without concrete evidence, largely based on anecdotal findings. On the other hand, the escape and integration theory suggests that Rockefeller might have survived and assimilated into the Asmat culture. This theory was partially fueled by a photograph depicting a light-skinned man among the tribe, leading to speculation that it could have been Rockefeller. Documentary filmmaker Fraser Heston, exploring this angle, found the photo provocative but inconclusive, and photographer Malcolm Kirk expressed skepticism about this interpretation. Therefore, the true nature of Michael Rockefeller's disappearance continues to elude clarity. Over time, the lack of definitive evidence has made it challenging to substantiate any of the theories. But again, the Rockefeller family has consistently held that Michael drowned, with his sister Mary voicing her concern that the mystery of his death has overshadowed his life's work and achievements. Subsequently, in the 21st century, renewed interest in the case spurred fresh investigations and documentaries. The 2011 documentary, The Search for Michael Rockefeller, revisited the enigmatic disappearance with updated information and additional footage, seeking to unravel the mystery that had captivated public interest for decades. In coping with Michael's disappearance, the Rockefeller family navigated through a spectrum of emotions and responses, including hope, acceptance, and a desire for privacy. In the immediate aftermath, hope prevailed, with Nelson Rockefeller, Michael's father, personally chartering a jet to aid in the search. However, as the exhaustive search efforts proved fruitless, the family came to accept the conclusion that Michael had drowned. Over the years, the Rockefellers have maintained a discreet stance regarding Michael's disappearance, choosing to focus on their philanthropic activities and other familial interests, rather than publicly discussing the incident. From the perspective of the Asmat people, the disappearance of Michael Rockefeller is a matter of complex and sensitive cultural implications. At the time Michael vanished, the Asmat region was a place where practices like headhunting and cannibalism were indeed still prevalent. Thus, the enduring rumors and speculations that Michael might have been murdered and possibly cannibalized by the Asmat have persisted, although there is no concrete evidence to corroborate these claims. Presently, the Asmat people exhibit a palpable fear and reluctance to discuss Michael Rockefeller, reflecting the deep cultural impact and apprehension surrounding the event. In their oral histories, the tale of Michael's disappearance has become embedded, contributing another dimension to their rich and multifaceted cultural narrative. Michael Rockefeller's disappearance therefore remains not only a mystery in the annals of exploration and adventure, but also a poignant reminder of the unpredictable nature of encounters between vastly different cultures. The story, still resonating with intrigue and unanswered questions, continues to captivate the public's imagination, symbolizing the enduring human fascination with unsolved mysteries and the often unforeseeable consequences of cultural intersections.